so it's a hard act to follow coming after uh, Carlo, um, who's also a prof, of course, and used to keeping the audience entertained. Um, there was an interesting question earlier about, um, you know, is this all of this uh, uh, digital experimentation, Internet of Things stuff, is it all just kind of somewhat frivolous uh, um, uh, and, and, and playful with respect to the real problems of the world? And there was a, um, a, an Internet meme uh, a couple of years ago called First World Problems. Um, everybody was, was tweeting hashtag first world problems with kind of frivolous problems of rich people in rich countries and comparing them with the problems of poor people in poor countries. And, and like most internet memes, it was kind of crass and, 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 and superficial and, and actually illogical and false, um, but also uh, 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 obviously had some very strong appeal to people, was resonating um, in some in some deeper way, in spite of its silliness, and if you look at the first world problems tweets, what's interesting about them is that they almost all are about problems related to technology, whether it's you know the cup, the plastic cup of your Starbucks coffee. Um, you know, or, or, or the 50-inch TV on the ceiling at your dentist. Um, it's the interactions with, with technology that people were tweeting about. And I thought that was really interesting and, and, and reflects something, some kind of deeper truths about our um, condition as tool makers, as, as, as human beings. You know, we, we make things, we make tools, we make technologies to address the problems that we have. And in doing so, um, we either reveal or create new problems, new opportunities, of course, but also new problems. And, and, um, and, and so the spiral uh, begins again. And in fact, you know, we live in such a, 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 a human created industrial society that almost all of our problems are of our own creation. That doesn't mean we've made things worse. It just means the problems we inherited uh, uh, when we came into the, to the world uh, uh, um, in pre-industrial society have kind of been addressed and we've created new problems for ourselves through industrial society. And that principle is very evident in the, in the field where I work, which is healthcare, in the emergence of chronic non-communicable diseases as the primary issue that we have to deal with in, in healthcare because we've done such a good job of dealing with um, things like infectious disease and, and, and injuries and maternal health um, and, and infant health in all but the poorest countries Chronic disease, however, we've done a very poor job of addressing, so it remains as the primary healthcare problem that we have to deal with in the world today. You see that the stats here are for the, um, for the uh, uh, World Bank income levels around the world, and you can see there's only one income level, which is low income, which means uh, average uh, uh, income uh, GDP per capita of less than $1,000 a year the only kind of country where chronic disease is not the biggest healthcare problem uh, to deal with. Everywhere else, we're from 70% up to 90% of people dying from chronic diseases and not from bugs or, or, or injuries um, as we did in the past. And what's unique about chronic diseases is they're diseases that have a long duration and, and a slow progression. Um, things like heart disease or diabetes or asthma, most mental illnesses, um, uh, uh, most cancers today, in fact, have this characteristic. We can't fix them, we can't make them go away, but we can live with them successfully for many years, for many decades. Um, and, and our attention needs to go to how do we prevent them, how do we manage them over time, and how do we have a good quality of life uh, while living with chronic disease. Now, um, you know, chronic disease sounds very dramatic, um, but the reality is, you know, if this is an average room full of um, 
Western European adults, half of you have at least one chronic disease, and one quarter of you have two or more chronic diseases. So this is actually everybody's problem. It's not some uh, uh, remote um, issue far from us. And to deal with chronic disease, you need long-term response. You need a kind of coordinated response over time, over years, over decades. And our healthcare systems are incredibly poor at doing that, because they're structured around acute episodes, which they've been very good at, at, at dealing with, as we said before. And now, and now these, these healthcare systems, which have been designed to deal with acute care, are actually spending most of their time, most of their resources, most of their efforts badly managing chronic disease. Um, to understand that a bit better, we can think about you know, chronic disease within the spectrum of... of, of um, healthcare environments or spheres of activity. You know, when we think about healthcare, we often think about hospitals or doctors' offices, right? The formal healthcare system, uh, where people are paid to deliver healthcare services, um, and the focus is on, you know, curing a disease. Um, that's actually where we spend a very small amount of our time as, as, as people living with, with chronic disease. We spend most of our time living our lives out in the world, in our communities, with our families, um, in our workplaces, um, in our churches, in our schools. That's where healthcare is actually happening for chronic disease. It's not paid. It's powered by emotional connections and relationships uh, to a large part. And the focus is less on curing a disease as, as in caring for a person. And kind of between these two worlds, um, we have um, what we can call the, the point of care, the point of contact between you know, healthcare professionals and, um, and the people that they, that they care for. And what has been emerging in our healthcare practice over the last 10 years is an incredible potential of connected health um, to address chronic disease in a new way. And when I talk about connected health, I mean exploiting the possibilities of us all having these things in our pockets, of um, sensors and wearables in our, in our bodies, in our homes, um, of the internet, uh, the old internet, the new internet of things, all of this technology applied to healthcare and to the way that we deliver care um, in the world. And, and the potential that those kind of technological enablers um, have is to kind of bring these different spheres of activity together, um, recognizing their overlaps and, in fact, recognizing that we as people, you know, live our lives in different roles within those different spheres in different moments, and we can provide kind of continuity and connectivity across those spheres of activity with, um, with connected technology. Um, and there are um, four kind of main um, vectors that that takes that um, I, can, I can briefly talk you through. Um, the first is in the idea of collaborative treatment relationships. Um, the idea that our relationships with our doctors, with the people who take care of us, um, will pass from, or are passing from, a kind of paternalistic model where the job of the doctor is to tell me what to do and my job is to obey him, and it was him uh, to a large degree, right, in the past. Um, to a model where it's actually a dialogue between adults, uh, where I have exclusive knowledge that the doctor does not have access to. I have exclusive knowledge about my life and my priorities and how I feel, my subjective experience, um, that are as important to that discussion as the exclusive knowledge that the doctor has, that is technical knowledge about how my body works and about the treatment options that may be available to me. And so collaborative treatment relationships are about how do we find a common round where that um, information can be exchanged and that kind of dialogue can be had. And um, digital tools, connected tools, are actually really great at providing that kind of platform. So 
one of the ideas that we've been working on, you see illustrated here, is, is the idea of moving from the prescription to the care plan. So the, the, the only thing on a piece of paper that we often come out from a doctor uh, with is a prescription for drugs, right? So it's almost as if their exclusive field of activity is medication um, of the patient. However, probably in many cases, a doctor may have told us things that are somehow given less importance, like, yeah, you should take a 30-minute walk every day, or, you know, you should try to eat a little bit less salt, or, um, you know, you should uh, be tracking this or that metric of your body. But that's all somehow kind of advice compared to the prescription of medication, which is the serious part of medicine. And by putting these things actually on the same plane, within this concept of, of, of a care plan and saying, hey, let's make decisions together. Let's evaluate the options on all of those variables and make a decision together. Not only do we give pew dignity to, more, <laughs> pew dignity, more dignity to those uh, um, uh, uh, other areas of care, um, but we also, as that's a shared decision, make it much more likely that I'm actually going to follow through on that. Right? I'm much more likely to follow through on a decision that I feel like I participated in. I said, oh, I understand the options, and this is what's right for me. This is what I commit to being able to do. Then if I simply receive input, you must do this. Um, and then once such a shared commitment has been made, it's vital to be able to um, follow through on that and maintain a dialogue about it over time. And that's where the, the, the kind of connected side of digital technologies becomes uh, incredibly powerful because you can have a kind of distributed and diffuse dialogue over time or an on-demand dialogue um, that, is, that is dynamic and, and, and dependent on events. Um, so uh, uh, we move away from a model where, let's say, everybody with a certain condition has a standard protocol where they should come in to the, to the doctor um, you know, once every three months for a regular checkup, or else if something goes drastically wrong, right, to a model where through uh, uh, this kind of remote dialogue and actual monitoring of how things are going for me, we can intervene before things go wrong on an on-need basis in what's called a kind of initiative care uh, approach. And if, nothing's, if there's no problem, well, don't go in for your quarterly visit and don't have to take that, uh, uh, that time off work. Um, the second uh, uh, area, really important area, um, is about enhancing self-management capabilities. So as a patient living with a chronic disease, um, I'm the person who bears most of the load. I'm the person who... Um, deals with the, 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 the consequences of my good or bad management um, of, of, of my disease. And I carry a tremendous financial and cognitive and emotional and, 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 and practical uh, burden. So anything that we can do to kind of give me superpowers to deal with that um, is tremendously important. And that can go from very small things uh, uh, functional support, just remembering and understanding uh, uh, what it is I'm supposed to be doing. Um, there's good research that shows that people forget between 70 and 90% of what they're told by a doctor before they leave the room. Um, and um, if you're lucky, you have something scribbled illegibly on a piece of paper. So just designing a, a kind of well uh, uh, thought through artifact in terms of what it is, what did we agree? What is it that I'm supposed to be doing? What are my goals? And how uh, uh, am I going to be following through on them? Is, is, is tremendously valuable, as are ways that we can use uh, digital technologies to gradually provide me information over time so I'm not in kind of information overload. I can gradually learn about my body, how my body works, um, and, and become an expert in my own uh, self-management over time without dumping Wikipedia on me in one session. Um, really important for all of these uh, principles to work is to be able to bring together um, different forms of data about my daily life, um, about 
behavior and, and, and the context within that behavior happens, as well as about actual health outcomes. And that kind of data gathering, um, which you know, people have been doing with patient logbooks and so on on pieces of paper in an ad hoc way for decades, is becoming easier and easier and more and more seamless with digital tools. So we can uh, uh, track things automatically with sensors, with biosensors. We can very easily use digital journaling on, 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 on mobile phones, embedded sensors in our homes to bring together this rich data about behavior and context and outcomes um, that enables then dialogue and decision making. The third area is about social support. So we said before, people are living their daily lives out in society 99% of the time. They're not in the doctor's office, we hope, or in the hospital, we hope. We hope they're out in their workplaces and families and, and, and communities. And that's where a tremendous amount of um, value can be provided through social support. When, when you say social today, um, there's a tendency to think that you're talking about Facebook. They've kind of taken over the word. Um, of course, that's not what social means, although Facebook is tremendously important in healthcare. There are a lot of people who gain a huge benefit, emotional and functional benefit, by sharing their health stories in public social media, as well as in um, more specialized uh, social media platforms for people with specific conditions. But there's also a really interesting, um, let's say, miniature social network that exists around each of us related to our health of those two or three or maybe at most four people who actually genuinely care and support us in our, in our daily uh, 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 activities related to our health. And, and there are all kinds of, of virtuous behaviors that we see in successful chronic disease patients where things like um, a spouse who becomes your medication manager. So it's one less thing on your mind. You don't need to remember to take your pills because your husband or your wife reminds you. And you've got 101 other things to worry about in managing your chronic disease. And those kinds of little behaviors are very easy to encourage and enable with digital tools um, and, and kind of spread that behavior to a broader set um, of, of people. The final area... Uh, um, is around reorganization of, of healthcare service delivery. So let's say the formal healthcare system and the way that it is organized. And today, you know, any of you who have experience with, with, with the healthcare system, you have the experience of feeling like um, you are squeezed as a person into a mechanized system in your interactions with it. And the, the, the reorganization that we're talking about is really flipping that on its head and understanding how can healthcare delivery be organized around the person rather than the person having to reorganize themselves around um, healthcare delivery. Um, and um, within that, one of the most important ideas, um, especially when we talk about chronic disease, is this idea of population health management. So that is to say, if I have um, a population of diabetics, for example, there's a certain proportion of them, about a third of them, who are doing fine and don't need any help from the, from the healthcare system. Um, they're, they're autonomous, they're managing their, their, their disease well, um, and uh, are very low risk, will live long and healthy lives without us needing to do anything more. There's a, there's a, a, a middle section who are kind of a bit shakier, um, who go through you know, rough spots uh, every now and then. So they need a helping hand every now and then um, to, to keep them on track. And then there's uh, the, the kind of most expensive third, which is actually where most of the money in the healthcare system gets spent, which are those who are really um, struggling to... Uh, uh, successfully manage their, their, their chronic disease and they repeatedly have acute incidents where they do themselves a lot of damage by having heart attacks or hypo, uh, hypoglycemic comas and these kind of things and, and that uh, is where you know, the, 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 the healthcare system ends up pouring a huge amount of effort. So what we can do with all of this uh, uh, digital data is actually identify those strata in the population ahead of time and understand uh, who needs attention, not based on who is already in trouble, but based on who is most likely to get into trouble um, and, and, and reach out to, to, to help them earlier. And that requires also new professional roles. If we recognize that, um, that my behavior 
within my daily life and my ability to kind of manage daily life is crucial to my health outcomes there, and that some people need help with that, you know, potentially uh, someone who has gone through a doctor, someone who's gone through a you know, nine to 12 year educational pathway to learn an incredible amount of detailed information uh, about the machine of the human body is not necessarily the right person to encourage me to remember to take my pills on time or to uh, remind me to go to my next diagnostic appointment. So we have figures like um, health coaches and, or health concierges who are people whose primary role is actually to help uh, uh, chronic disease patients in their daily life and provide that continuity of care. And across each of these four areas where connected health technologies can help, these, these are actually, they map to the key areas that uh, the World Health Organization has identified um, for more successful uh, long-term treatment of chronic disease. So enhancing those self-management capabilities, providing better social support, uh, establishing more collaborative relationships with physicians, and, and organizing care delivery around the patient. Where these things happen, we get better outcomes. Um, but even more importantly for that, more importantly than that, um, they make us happier people, right? We started this by talking about quality of life. We have to live with chronic diseases for decades. They're part of our daily life. It's important that we have good quality of life. So feeling more able to take care of myself, getting support from, from, from those around me, having a relationship with a doctor where I'm treated as an adult and, and, and my concerns and my considerations are as important as, 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 as his or hers and, and having interactions that feel like they are tailored to my needs, these all make me not only a healthier but also a happier uh, 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 person in, in my daily life. And, um, this kind of is a, is, a, is a vision of what can be a connected care landscape um, in the future where um, th th that has two key parts. The first is that each of us as an individual understands and takes responsibility for our own health. However, we are not kind of abandoned with that responsibility, but you know, the, the social context around us provides us with the resources to take that responsibility. And I think that's a really important shift. So rather than, um, let's say, the, 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 the state or the healthcare system saying, don't worry, I'll take care of your health, it becomes a situation where we say, hey, you need to take care of your health, but you know, the resources are here, depending on who you are and what your needs are, to enable you to actually live up to that responsibility and successfully um, uh, achieve it. And that's um, a kind of shared vision across the growing kind of connected care and, and digital health um, community uh, that we participate in, and I hope that maybe uh, some of the innovators and, and, and designers and entrepreneurs and engineers in the room um, might, uh, might want to join us on that journey. Thank you. Otherwise, I'll ask a question to start with. My first question is your words for the future. So after listening to this presentation, um, I, can I can give you some words from Ferrara, less things, more flexible, and from Carlo Ratti, less, th less things, better told. Uh, so you're focusing on less, do, do less with more. Improved ability to self-manage, so more capabilities and a methodology to self-manage. Thank you so much, Thomas, for your input. 
During Charrette with Luigi Ferrara, we will dwell into it also with the support of uh, expert advisors and we will talk about healthcare as well as this is uh, something that we're very much all involved into. So while these technologies become more and more available, it is nice to see that we're shifting uh, from technologies only to the value that they hold, that they embed also from a social viewpoint. It makes me feel quite confused and dazzled as well because he, I would say that the healthcare system nowadays is pretty stuck and it is not really moving forward in those terms. So can you see this future already there? It is a future that is already there. It is a shift though, that it is not happening yet, and it is not being raised by the healthcare system, meaning, meaning the institutional healthcare system. But it is a shift, it is a change that is still happening from the outside, and it is... Uh, it, and it means to change things. But let's bear in mind that health is not a healthcare system. So healthcare system has an institution as an authority or as a department, if you will. They should take action when we're sick. But that doesn't have anything to do with our health. Our health is our own responsibility. And that is where things are changing. Patients are changing. Awareness and it is coming and it is uh, coming from the outside hopefully changing things from scratch from thank you thank you so much